Okay, um, well, let's get started. Uh, you saw the uh, intro to a documentary made in 1972 um, about uh, ARPANET, which was um, quite easily and quite arguably the, the first um, internet. And um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, these communication channels were built and the technologies uh, of uh, passing information around in the form of packets uh, with uh, what we now think of as an IP address uh, were formed in the late 60s and then the first networks were built um, in 1970 uh, in uh, California um, and then they built out from there and you know what, what happens after that. Uh, today's lecture is on uh, web development with uh, Python and we've seen bits and pieces of our interaction with, uh, with uh, web pages already. Uh, we now know through URL, URL lib and URL lib2 um, how we can uh, get data and how we can post uh, data to uh, other servers. Effectively now we're going to be talking about building uh, a framework for you to be able to present uh, your own data to collaborators, to build a communal site perhaps for you to interact with your collaborators and so on. Um, today, just like almost all of our lectures, we're going to be fairly agnostic about the specific application and just give you uh, the tools that you'll need to be able to um, uh, build whatever it is that you're going to wind up needing. Uh, I suspect that many of you for your final project will wind up using a lot of what we do today as part of, uh, as part of that project. Um, building just a web framework for web framework's sake and building something that you can interact with just to do that is, is obviously not all that interesting. What we're hoping you do is you pull bits and pieces from uh, the rest of the course and perhaps you wrap it around in some sort of interactive uh, website that um, you and your collaborators can use for doing science. Um, so we'll talk about the web paradigm um, and then uh, essentially using Python um, within that paradigm We'll introduce uh, basic uh, Python servers, and then we'll talk about frameworks, and uh, we'll use uh, Django, which is sort of Python's answer to Ruby on Rails. And then I'll mention at the end a bit about the Google App Engine. So I'm sure many of you know um, that the internet was not made uh, for Reddit and passing around um, silly email messages uh, amongst friends. Um, this is a, a terrible reference to the late uh, Senator Stevens from Alaska who, who said that the internet was a series of tubes. Um, I just had to do another meme because uh, it's highly relevant. I found this on the web the other day. Uh, coded the in-trade DB homework early, shorted Santorum and made a lot. If you knew that he uh, was going to lose uh, Puerto Rico yesterday or whatever last week, you'd be making a lot of money. Um, so what the internet was really for uh, was for scientists um, to communicate uh, rapidly and to pass information around. Uh, the ARPANET, as we saw at the beginning of that documentary, was 50 kilobits a second in 1970. Um, ARPA uh, stands, or used to stand for Advanced Research Projects Agency. It now stands for Address and Routing Parameter Area. Um, and there's obviously outcroppings of that agency, but it was effectively funded in large part by, uh, by the US government. The first browser model uh, came around in about 1990, um, and that was the so-called World Wide Web, all one word. Um, that was before it was shortened to WWW. And that quickly morphed into um, something called Next. Uh, and then in 1992 is when NCSA Mosaic came around, and then the founder of that started uh, Netscape. And then other things happen with the internet after that. So uh, we've seen pieces of this already when we talked about XML RPC servers. Um, but effectively, when we are interacting uh, within a browser, uh, what we're doing is we are asking something of the server. This is what we call the request. The server does magic. And then it sends data back. And then your browser will wind up rendering um, that magic. Uh, there are obviously a series of protocols of um, what it is you're actually passing around. We're not talking about the TCP IP layer, of course, right? We've talked a little bit about um, routing. We're more or less assuming that whatever layers we're um, using to pass our packets around are, are essentially able to deal with the concatenation of those packets and present those essentially at the text-based level 
uh, to, um, uh, to the server. And what we're not focusing on is the web browser stuff for now. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, the thing on the right-hand side. That's the server. So here is essentially a GET request, and it's saying, give me back uh, index HTML, and I know how to render things in HTTP uh, 1.1 format. And the response initially says, OK, I know, I know how to send you that kind of stuff. This is a two, 200 response. And then they sort of get talking in this back and forth um, uh, dance. The browser stuff, of course, is very interesting. And making things look good uh, within a browser um, is obviously important if you're going to be serving out uh, HTML. Um, typically, what will, and this is a, a reference for you to go check out um, the Google Code University. They have a lot of um, nice and very deep uh, uh, pages in not just HTML, but a number of other things, including um, Python. Hopefully, you know Python well enough to be able to zip through uh, that, that part of the site. Um, but when we talk about browser stuff, uh, you know, when we, and we've seen this a couple of times, so that's why I'm sort of going over this pretty quickly. Um, HTML is the structure, it's the, it's the language um, that is the markup of the information content that you'd like to uh, provide um, to the end user. Uh, generally, we like to break up um, structure, content, presentation, and behavior. And the sort of nominal ways to do that now is with HTML5, something called Cascading Style Sheets, or CSS. And that's the thing that is used to um, kind of wrap around our HTML and, dis and essentially present uh, that same content and structure in different ways. So the same structure and content can look very, very different depending on what kind of style sheets you have. You can change fonts. You can change backgrounds. Um, you can change your interaction as you move your mouse around. Um, the dynamic stuff generally comes with uh, JavaScript. Um, and so you build little codes inside of your HTML, and you send that. And then the, the client within the browser um, knows how to do sort of uh, dynamic stuff. For a while, there was a, a, a sort of sense of building dynamic HTML or DHTML. That sort of gone away. Um, now we're really kind of in this, uh, in this uh, paradigm. Where HTML5 sit, sits in all this, I guess at some level, it's allowing us to do all these three things again uh, in the same way. But people are still writing JavaScript. People are still writing cascading style sheets. Um, and they're still writing HTML. OK, so what is it, what's Python's role in all this? Python is used to um, generate the HTML content. And if it has to pass style sheets around, it'll do that as well. Um, in general, though, when you think about sort of making pretty pages, what you typically will wind up doing is create a cascading style sheet um, by, you know, in your own free time. You maybe even hire a web designer to, to do that for you. That's a huge ecology of, uh, of uh, people and ideas um, behind it. And same thing with JavaScript. What you'd like to be able to do is serve the, the minimal amount of content in the form of HTML uh, that gets the job done for whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and, uh, and finally, we use Python to serve all this stuff um, to the end user. OK, so let's go back a few lectures to uh, the XML RPC server. Um, XML RPC was essentially a, a different set of handshaking, a different set of requests and responses. Effectively, we're going to be able to do the same thing. And I should mention, for those that haven't already, uh, if you go to BSpace under weekly lectures, there's a tarball called uh, week9 underscore web, I think that TGZ. Please um, download uh, that. And you should be able to get some of this code, if not all, that, uh, all of this code. Um, I'm not sure I have this one uh, already. I think it may be called hello.py. Um, but we can try to run this. So uh, Python has a, a built-in module called base HTTP server. And you can guess what that does. That creates a base web server for you. Um, and what you do is you create uh, a class uh, that, is a, um, that has as its base uh, this object called base HTTP server, base HTTP server request handler. And so we can call this anything we want. This is effectively the functionality of your application will be put inside of my response. Um, you overwrite uh, something called do underscore get. It is a method of, um, of uh, all of these uh, uh, HTTP, base HTTP request handlers. And um, it is passed something 
uh, only only one argument, and you say s dot uh, w file dot write hello. So now we're essentially just creating a hello world program, and then we have our little HTTP daemon, which of course we can call it anything we want. We establish where this uh, server is going to live. It'll be on localhost. You could say 127.0.0.1 um, for your, uh, that, that's essentially a, uh, an IP address for the lookup of localhost. And we're going to put it on port 8082. Um, typically, your web server lives on um, port 80. And so if you don't tell a web browser which port to go to, it will naturally look at 80. I believe it will then, if it doesn't find anything there, it maybe goes to 81 or 88. But typically, um, when you're playing around and you're doing development stuff, you want to put um, your web servers at a high-level port. Uh, many of you uh, already have web servers uh, installed on your computers in the form, I think most uh, modern distributions now come with Apache. Many of you may even have that. So if you've got some personal blog page that you use to take notes in classes, um, you may have started that up. If you're on a Mac, you can basically fire up your web server from within the preferences and you can have essentially the full functionality of all of Apache, and that's kept mildly up to date for you. Um, but this is uh, the Pythonic way to do that. And then just like with the XML RPC server, we have to serve forever. So essentially we're entering a loop and we're waiting for requests uh, to come in. So W file is the output uh, file uh, stream that you wind up writing to. And um, one of the important things about uh, what we have within Python, uh, at least in the form of this base HTTP server, is that it is not threaded. So if I have multiple requests all coming in at exactly the same moment, uh, this server is effectively going to wind up queuing them up and blocking on all of them until the next one comes in. Modern web servers, of course, are ones that can deal with multiple requests simultaneously, can fork them off if they need to do lots of jobs, the different uh, nodes inside of a cluster, uh, maybe can even do this stuff um, in the cloud. Uh, but for now, this is just the basic functionality. Um, so we can try to fire that up, um, if you're interested, and see how that responds. OK. Oops, that's weird. What are you doing? I'll just look at what there. Oh, did I tar that up and I didn't save it? That's really strange. Huh, I must have moved something around. So you should be doing the same thing, I guess, ah. without all the mistakes. All right, um, so we have a bunch of different Python files in here. I think, uh, oh, OK. So I did actually save this in the form of uh, hello.py. So if you type Python hello.py, you just see nothing happens. It's because we're sitting around. But I now know that on port 8082 on localhost, I should be serving a web page which will um, talk the HTTP uh, protocol. Let me get a web browser up. Huh. Sorry. Here I am. So localhost. 8082, hello. And if I go to 8083, there's nothing serving there. It says, I don't know what to do. Let's go back there. Hello. Doesn't do anything really interesting, but at least you see the initial functionality. OK. Um, we can do something a little bit more interesting, uh, which is in this httpd.py. It's, it's sending something a little bit more interesting where 
Um, we can actually look, look that over now. Uh, we can actually um, see what the functionality is. One of the things that does happen is when we get this call, we're going to print out to the command line some interesting statistics about what's actually being received by this uh, uh, web server. So let's take a look at that code. Let me kill that with just a control C. So it's similar to what we had before. Uh, we've set a name uh, main. So this is what gets called if I wind up um, starting this from the command line. Um, it looks very similar to what I had before. I'm saying uh, deal with a request and send it to the, my handler. Again, I have a do get. And you see that I need to send back. I need to sort of talk uh, the HTTP uh, protocol uh, well. If I don't do it, then there's some defaults of what actually gets sent. But what I initially want to send is that response. So I want to send the 200, which is just the OK, I hear you, I hear your request. I'll then send back some header information. So I start sending, a, uh, send, start sending the headers. I'm going to say I'm going to send you uh, text, and it's of MIME type HTML. I'm going to then send uh, some actual HTML in this uh, uh, W file write. Um, and um, one of the things that we'll wind up doing is in the get request, there is going to be um, a, essentially a, um, a, a variable that is created for me, or an attribute that's created for me, which is called .path. And you can play around and learn what's in this. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this way of doing web pages, so I won't go into the details of it. But effectively, what I'm going to do is say, OK, what you actually asked for is you know, something which has a path of foo bar. And I'll send that back to you and tell you um, that that's what you asked for. I'll do a serve forever, and I'll be a little bit more graceful when I have a keyboard interrupt. So if I do control C to get out of it, I'm, going to do, I'm not going to sort of shut everything down uh, in a bad way. I'll do it as gracefully as I can. So um, let's, see, uh, let's see what that looks like. So you notice I got some, some nice information here. I started the server that comes from here. And let's go back. So where am I serving on 8083? By the way, should this work again? No, because I'm not serving anything there. Uh, this is a test. You access this path, because I didn't actually give it anything. I'll say foo bar. Justin Bieber, is it E I B E R? Is that right? Don't pretend like you don't know. <laughs> I was just trying to see who actually knows. Um, <laughs> anyway, so anyway, so I, so the important thing here is that I get access to what it was requested. It's not just a completely anonymous request just saying do stuff for me. Effectively, now is how you would wind up uh, saying, oh well, if that person asked for Justin Bieber. Send them back, you know, Rick roll them or something, right? Um, <laughs> or Justin Bieber them or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, so now you can see how you can start building in functionality and taking different actions within the response handler based on what actually got passed to you through the uh, command line. So we saw this already, just to show you again um, in, your, uh, in your notes what this uh, would look like. OK, so Python gives you this way to do this very, very basic uh, web server. And um, what we're going to now do is kind of start building out into other Pythonic ways of doing that. Typically, what we're going to wind up having to do, however, is get some third-party stuff. Um, so uh, there is a nice and one of the earliest sort of third-party web frameworks that um, has just been getting better and better is called Cherry Pi. If you don't have this already, in fact, I probably I think the nthought distribution does not come with this. Do a pip uh, install uh, Cherry Pie or easy under, uh, install uh, Cherry Pie. I'll give you a minute to do that, and then we'll write our first Cherry Pie um, web application.
I believe that there are no other dependencies, or at least they, most of the other dependencies are, are uh, already satisfied with the nth dot distribution. But this should be one of the easier ones. You'll know this works if you type Python and then you say import cherry pie and you don't get an error. I believe, actually, I don't remember the current version. It's like 1.3. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm thinking of Django. Yeah. Yes. OK. So anyone, everyone OK with that? All right. Let's go on. So there is a file in that same tarball called CP1, or Cherry Pie 1. And it does uh, essentially not much more than what we had before, except it's able to, um, with a lot fewer lines of code, sort of do all the HTTP handshaking where it's sending the headers and it's sending the, re the 200 response for you. Um, but now it's doing something which may actually start to be pretty interesting. So um, I, I build a class, and I, I guess I should have uh, uh, made as its base class uh, uh, just object, but that's OK. Um, and then I'm going to create a, um, a method within that class. So I can call that class anything I want. I'll call it a welcome page. And now you can imagine each uh, class that you build is sort of a different landing page. So if I had a logout page, a login page, or a visualize this page, um, each one of these things could basically be set up uh, to interact with um, a different call that somebody's going to wind up making. We'll, we'll show you how to sort of route, um, uh, you know, basically uh, different URL locations to, to different places. Um, but anyway, we'll now have this method called greet user, and uh, we're going to say uh, the first argument is self, and we're going to give it a keyword name, and it will default to none. So if name is not none, then we're going to say something, hey, what's up uh, to the user? And we should have actually just returned HTML. But for now, it's OK to just return back text. Um, but if we're being really legal about it, we should have said, you know, bracket HTML, bracket body, hey, what's up, and then close all those tags. But that, this, is, this is just fine. If it's not, I'm going to say, um, OK, well, what you should really do is you should call me like the following with a slash, greet user, blah, blah, blah. And the nice thing is you can say greet user dot exposed equals true so that different, um, uh, uh, essentially different methods uh, within this uh, welcome page you could actually develop. And some of these methods may be hidden. So if one of these methods is essentially just a helper method for something else that you're doing within your class, then you don't have to expose it. And somebody can't actually get access to this. Um, but unless you do something fancy, and Cherry Pie certainly lets you rename um, methods as viewed by the browser, you notice that the way we're going to call this thing is with greet user. And because greet user is now an exposed method, um, it will be visible by uh, you know, our calls at this web page level. And then we say Cherry Pie quick start, which just gets our whole web framework going. And then we say, essentially, um, deal with responses by um, going to this welcome page. All right, so let's try that. Let me kill that. And you notice, by the way, that that uh, the previous example we had exited gracefully. There wasn't a keyboard interrupt problem that showed because we handled that exception um, gracefully. You, you did control C. I did Control C. Yeah. You can't see my fingers in there. <laughs> OK, so you notice we've got some interesting stuff. It's kind of showing us the kind of debug information that we might want. What? What did I just do? Oh, it's not free. I must be running some other thing on port 880. So I have to edit this. Uh, I better, um, oh, I have to call this. I forget. Shoot. I forget. I think I have to give this uh, some other some other port. Let's let's inspect this. So cherry pie, um, and then quick start. 
let's say figure out what I have to do. So I have to set up a configuration um, file. This is a real big bummer because I didn't want to have to deal with um, going onto different ports. Uh, you have the notebook server open? I think I, I think I must have something like that open, and I have too much stuff open on my machine, so I'm just going to kill things. There is a way to do this with config files where you set up the port, but I, I, I actually didn't want to get into the, the details of this because, again, we're going to sort of use Cherry Pie as a launching off point to show us kind of elegant ways of, um, of doing this. Well, I just killed a bunch of stuff. Let's see if that works now. You're not barfing at me, are you? You barfed at me. Um, so for some reason, I, I must have already something on port 880 from another uh, bummer. Is anyone else having problems with that? Probably not, because I've been running lots of uh, server examples. And the problem is I don't want to have to ramp up how to actually send this to a different send this to a different port. If somebody wants to Google that for me, of the exact call for that, what's that? Okay, you want to you want to tell me what it is? Config. Uh-huh. So all caps? Uh, oh, oh. Server. Server dot socket underscore port. Like that? Uh, I think it'll default right. So let's let's try that. Okay, now it's serving on the right place. And you better not barf at me. Okay, you didn't barf. Okay, good. Yeah, I think maybe the notebook is screwing me up on some other browser. I'll blame the notebook. It's all your fault. Notebook. All right. So we said we're going to look at port 90, 890. Um, and our request was going to be get user, greet user. Thank you. So here is an example where we got a web page back from Cherry Pie that gives us sort of debug information saying that thing doesn't exist. I didn't give it uh, any um, uh, get parameters. So it's saying, no, no, no. The way you should call me is with greet user question mark name. Name equals Justin. And then it says, hey, Justin, what's up? OK, so now it's a slightly non-trivial example of a, of a web server. Um, if I gave it more information, so um, I don't know, pet name or something. Uh, it says, no, I don't really know how to handle that. So if you really wanted to handle an arbitrary number of get parameters, what you could potentially do is just um, do a double star keyword args. So it would just sop in anything else that's thrown at it. Um, but for now, you know, we're making basically a structure that requires us to have only name. And if it doesn't have name, then it knows how to handle that error gracefully. Thanks for the um, for the port stuff. Okay, so we'll do something um, that's uh, also a little bit less trivial, which is to actually return back um, when somebody goes to the index, which is what you get. You go to index.html or index.htm if you don't um, give it any other arguments after the. Uh, the base URL that you go to and its port. So now we're going to actually present a, uh, uh, a little form for somebody to fill out. And this is the, uh, HTML, this is the HTML on the right-hand side in green. 
you set what the form is and then the action and will be a method of uh, get. So this is going to a greet user after somebody clicks submit and then you basically give them the place where they can enter the data and you set what the name of that variable is going to be called and in this case it's called name uh, and then you close out that form. And I need to now expose that index. So let's take a look um, at what that looks like. We may have the same port problem as we had before. So let me close this out with a control C and let's try CP2. Are you barfing at me? You did barf at me, didn't you? Okay, so now I'll just grab the that line from CP1 and I'll put it to a different port. Oops. As you may have figured out, I'm terrible at this. Uh, two. There we go. Okay. And let's put it at 80, 90, 1. No barf. No barf. All right, let's take a look at our web browser. We'll go to 8091. What is your name? I don't know. Doogie Hauser. Hey, Doogie Hauser, what's up? Okay, so now we're getting the back and forth interaction. And you notice what I actually have, have uh, uh, called directly is the greet user with name equals Doogie plus Hauser. Remember that there's, uh, you have to deal with uh, spaces by encoding those in, in, uh, in, in different strings that the, uh, the um, browser knows how to uh, uh, deal with, or the server knows how to deal with. So if I just change this to Doogie Bieber, I'd get that back and I wouldn't have to go to my original form. So let's take a look at that um, code for a second. So now I have two methods um, inside of the welcome page. I have an index, which is just where I'm going to wind up landing if I don't give it um, a uh, slash greet user. I'm going to expose that. And when I'm, my form action is to do a get request um, which will map back to this uh, greet user. And we basically have exactly what we had before, and we expose that. Here is where the configuration file um, uh, should, should actually go. So here is where you would set up directly the port um, and the tutorial.conf. I'm not sure I put that in your directory. You don't actually need it for anything other than setting up port stuff. Um, and uh, don't worry, about, don't worry about the thing at the end. Uh, anyway, so we're now building up some interesting functionality uh, within, within a web page. So that's kind of cool. Um, but we're now developing all this stuff on our laptop. And let's say you've got somebody in your lab and you've been developing some nice sort of interaction. And you don't want to have to go off and buy like server space somewhere else. Or you don't want to install this on, say, maybe your lab's computer. Um, you want to just keep on developing on your laptop, but you want to show this, and you want to show this functionality off to a colleague. What you want to do is you basically want to give them a URL that they can go to and get into your web, get into your web server. Um, that's possible in a number of different ways. It's probably not possible if you're on uh, if you're on Air Bears. Um, oh, I think one of these probably started up. I'm just going to kill all this stuff. Let me start this uh, web server again, and I'll go to um, another tab. Why is it? Why is it? Why is it barfing? Something strange. Did I not close it well or something? I don't know. I'm going to just put this somewhere else. 
OK, so let me start running that. And that shouldn't barf at me. And it is not. And what I'll show you is what I want to show you on the next page, which is some cool thing that I found on the web called Local Tunnel. It's actually a Ruby on Rails code. There's a Python version of this. But if you have Ruby on Rails installed and you have something called gem installed, you can just do gem install local tunnel. And gem is like pip for Ruby. Um, and then what you do is you wind up mapping your port to some anonymous, well, not quite anonymous URL. And it gives it back to you. And you can give that to somebody. So you can actually have somebody uh, interacting with your web server from elsewhere. Um, and when you first set this up, you have to, um, you have to basically uh, set up some SSH keys and stuff. But it's, it's really easy to get going. So let me see if I can get this to work. Oh, why did it bail? Something is not right. Cherry pie should not be bailing. I don't have good. I don't have a good insight into that. Um, I really wanted to do a local tunnel for you. Let me just try. Local tunnel uh, 8099. So now I can presumably go to this website and assuming this didn't crash, which it did, I can try to call this thing. It crashed again. What the hell? Oh, there it is. OK. Um, what is your name? Doogie. Hey, what's up, Doogie? So you notice I didn't do this at localhost anymore. I'm guessing I have another cherry pie running somewhere else in some other browser. Uh, anyway, that's kind of cool. You can develop stuff on your, on your uh, on your laptop, and then you can serve it to other people through this uh, local tunnel. So I can access that? You can access that. You want to try to hit that? 4jxx.localtunnel.com. Computer explodes. Is that working for anybody? Yeah? Awesome. So it should work when a number of you all come in at the same time. It knows how to do not necessarily the asynchronous stuff, but it, Cherry Pie will sort of naturally do multi-threading for you. So it can have multiple requests happening and handling those at the same time. No, I think I I think it's running. I think it's running somewhere else. I'm not quite sure what's happening, frankly, but. If it works, it works. So you know that's that's how I roll. Um, all right. So now we have a mini breakout session for you, which is to change CP2, so that it asks the user for their name and their favorite color, then greet them with that color. So um, the way you do that in uh, HTML is if the color name is red, you just say font color red. So if I say What's your name, Josh? What's your favorite color? Crimson. You can actually just use the word crimson and stick it in, in there. And, or you could give it a, you know, one of these uh, uh, hex um, codes, six-digit codes. And you can um, show basically the response that we had before. So go into CP2, rename it CP3. And um, obviously, you have to add some functionality to that. So when, you, when we're actually going to build web frameworks, what you do is you create something called templates, which are, they look a lot like HTML, but they have um, kind of variables. And so if you know kind of the structure of the web page that you're going to present to somebody, but you don't know what their username is going to be, you don't know what their favorite color is, you can actually leave like the word red, you can leave that as a variable. And then you uh, more or less use your templates, and you add the variables as need be to those templates, and you render them. Um, but for now, 
this is one of the things with Cherry Pie. You can use templating, but for the easiest stuff, you would just write the HTML yourself. Just for the people that are listening in at home, that was not the notebook. That was an errant CP2 Python running from last night. We killed it, though, so now everything should be OK.
Yep. Anyone have any uh, different approaches? That's pretty much how to do it. So it's really only just changing a few lines. Just to summarize, um, you're not changing anything with the uh, arguments or the keywords of the index method um, of your welcome page. Uh, but you um, are changing the form, the actual HTML that gets sent back to it. And here, what I, I said was name equals fave color instead of color, but you can call it anything you want. Um, so if I called your code with fave color, it would wind up crashing, but that's fine. Um, and so uh, you're now sending two different um, variables effectively to the, uh, to the server, and it's colorizing um, what it sends back to you just with the uh, font color equals. And you could do this with a, a cascading style sheet, et cetera, but this is the old school way of, of making color. You could even do blink. I think that still works in some browsers. Yeah. Uh, were there any questions? They left it What's that? They left, they left it in HTML5, just as a shout out uh, yeah. to the past. So yes. Uh, the no really line, well, so if you'd have to modify it so that you'd say if, um, you know, if uh, name, and then you go in and you do something. But if I gave you like a fave color, so if I actually filled in this line, but I left that empty, and I click submit, it should probably, I think it gets submitted back as a, as a none. Um, some browsers may submit back an empty string, in which case that's not none. So probably a way to catch that would be if uh, uh, name in brackets, the list, empty string, comma, none. Um, if it's in there, then you wind up catching it and you say, hey, dude, you should tell you this is how you're supposed to call this thing. And you could also catch the fave color. Or you could do a lot more error checking around that. Is that clear? Like if I went into a different browser? How would it look? Um, well, some things like uh, the font size will be set by the default of the browser, but sure. you could send back a, uh, you could certainly send back a, I want you to be this font size in a, in a CSS. I'm just curious, do you think that that's like some browsers, this is none, but sometimes it will be, is that, is that a browser dependency? That, that kind of thing would be a browser dependency, and this is why you'd get paid big bucks to write code that works on like, Everything from Windows 3 to, to Chrome, whatever, right? Because it's fucking boring to you. You're on the internet. We can't use that word. <laughs> there is no such thing as boring on the internet. <laughs> the mic can't. There's a lot of that other stuff. The mic doesn't care. What? <laughs> Python doesn't care. So Python is getting, so your web, your, your, your web server is taking back this request, and it's just interpreting it, and it's sending it to the application part. Um, I think you know if you develop it in a couple different browsers and it seems like it works for you, that'd be fine. I don't think there is a standard, for instance, of when you have a form that's empty, uh, how you how you deal with that, and it's up to the the client, which is the browser, to decide how it's sending back that information. Why aren't they uniform? Do you do you know anything about the companies that are building browsers? They don't like each other a lot. Uh, so there are, there are standards that they are all sort of adhering to, um, but that, that kind of thing of how do you treat, so of course they're, they're speaking the correct server response standards, but how you treat the payload and how you treat like what's in the content of what you send back and forth is not at all, is not at all standardized. So you just, have to catch, you just have to catch it. Another way to do it if you really wanted to force it would be to build a little JavaScript that you send on your index page which you would send basically as, as part of your HTML payload. And that would do the checking of on click or on submit uh, within your form. It would go and it would look at each one of those things and it could pop up a, a you know, little thing that says, oh, you forgot to fill out this first one and refuse to actually go, by, go through and submit. So what you try to do if you're trying to build lots of user interface stuff where you have form interactions is you try to build as much of the error checking on the client side but in the end, especially if you're doing like sensitive transactions, it, I could easily defeat all the JavaScript stuff and, and you know, formulate a get code or a, you know, a get uh, URL that 
is not compliant with the stuff that you're supposed to be checking. So you almost always want to do both. You want to sanitize the input as much as you possibly can on the client side, and generally you do that with JavaScript. And then on the, on the server side, you just have to say, I've got to make sure that all this stuff is OK, too. Johnny drop tables, exactly. OK, so I've, I've uh, started talking a bit about frameworks and, and um, applications. I thought I'd introduce you um, to this concept of a web server gateway interface, um, which is pronounced Wisgi, uh, which sounds like whiskey. And if you had a lot of whiskey, that's how you actually pronounce whiskey. Um, so uh, this is the top level um, diagrammatic approach to how you actually build your um, Python applications when you know that they're going to wind up being sort of forward, fold, uh, forward facing at the, at the server level. Um, uh, so Whiskey uh, hasn't been around forever within Python. It's, it's a decidedly like Pythonic um, term. Uh, it was uh, put forth in one of these um, Python extension papers uh, 333. Um, because no one knows how to pronounce Whiskey, sometimes people just call this 333. Um, and there's a, a lot of discussion about what this actually means, but effectively it allows you to write the applications. So the actual stuff that's going to do things like uh, take in your username and push back out some HTML that's colorized, that's the stuff that you want to spend most of your time on. You don't want to have to spend a lot of your time on everything around it, all the web stuff. You don't want to have to take care of of uh, you know, uh, errors when people go to the wrong page. So um, Whiskey applications are callable Python objects. Um, and they are uh, always pass. And this, so basically, this pep uh, set up the structure of what Whiskeys were going to look like. They always pass two arguments. It's a Whiskey environment variable. And, um, and then another, uh, you pass it a function that is used to essentially do it, uh, to do the responses back and forth and allows you to do asynchronous responses. And you'll see that in just a second. Um, so um, what, what are some things to say here? In the Whiskey environment variable that you send it, that is where you encode what it is that uh, was passed to the browser. So if, the, if you're doing a get call, it says you know, the Whiskey type get is, or Whiskey type call equals get. Um, you get a lot of this information in the form of uh, what amounts to more or less a dictionary. And the nice thing is it abstracts for you as a user when you're writing your applications what framework is providing the server layer for you. So I can write an application, and I don't care whether I'm going to stick it inside of Django or inside of you know, Apache or inside of Cherry Pie inside of anything else. It allows you to actually just write code that's more about the functionality and less about the, the framework itself. So I wanted you to see that there is a difference between web servers and all of that stuff and then the actual core functionality. And what you really want to get to is thinking about these um, Python web apps. And it knows how to sort of talk back and forth to the web server through a standardized protocol, which is Whiskey. So if I come in from a client, and I'm going to post to slash login. So it's you know, local, local host uh, slash login. I'm going to now post. I'm going to post my username, which is foo, and my password, which is bar. The server is dealing with that request. It's dealing with the initial response saying, OK, sounds good. Um, and now what I'm seeing inside of my little Whiskey application is essentially just a dictionary. So there's a request underscore method, which is a post. Uh, the content length is 25. There's a whiskey.input, string IO, username, blah, blah, blah. So I have to be able to, to parse this stuff out within my application. The thing that's really nice about all this is there is a standard where all of the Pythonic web servers need to speak whiskey. And so if you write whiskey applications, at some level, you don't care where you wind up deploying it or how you wind up deploying it. So um, this is uh, some text that I stole from a, a talk um, that sort of goes through and shows sophisticated examples of whiskeys. Um, but the point is that if I, if I build a whiskey compliant application, then I can deploy it in servers that are good at different things. So if I care about a server that's really good at, at speed and performance, 
um, you can deploy it in that. If you want something that's uh, easily extensible and it's written in pure Python, you can do that. Um, I don't mean to proselytize about it, but it is, uh, it's kind of a very nice way of um, thinking about writing uh, Python applications. And I've given you some, uh, I've given you some references. There are some negatives uh, to Whiskey, as you might imagine, and there are some naysayers. Um, this is a very long blog entry about this that a lot of people point to. Um, so if you're really interested in understanding that architecture, um, you should look at that. Let me just show you quickly um, what I mean by uh, an application and the fact that it's agnostic to the server implementation of that. So at the top is a, um, is a WSGI uh, Python application. And you see it, again, takes two um, arguments. One is the environment, and that's, again, that, that dictionary that I showed you. And another is a file-like object, which you can call it anything you want. Here we've called it start response. And your job is to uh, essentially call it with um, the initial responses if you want to. And then you wind up yielding uh, uh, whatever it is that you want to come after that. So in this case, I'm going to wind up um, showing whatever is in the environment variable that I got passed. Now, um, in this main, and I didn't give you this file in your directory. It's, you can get it linked from uh, this uh, bitbucket.org. Um, now, depending on how I wind up calling this thing, I could use the Pythonic way of um, dealing with Whiskey. And there is something within the standard library called Whiskey Ref. And you create a simple server out of that. And now I'm going to serve it on some location. And I wind up calling it with a make server. And then I serve forever. Different web servers will effectively have different ways of starting things up, but they're all more or less using the same application. Right? So I can use Cherry Pie. I can use the standard ref. There's something called WorkZeg. Um, and there's literally dozens of these things that you could wind up using. The point is you should care mostly about the stuff at the top and not so much about um, the, how you actually deploy this. Um, you notice this is doing a yield because any, any WSGI server which is compliant with the WSGI protocol is basically saying to the application, what should I do next? What should I do next? What should I do next? And remember at the very uh, start of the course when we talked about uh, and we introduced this yield, remember yield was considered a temporary return. So every time this application gets called by this server, it's going to say, what should I do next? OK, uh, I'm going to yield this pre. Uh, what should I do next? OK, I'll do this printing. What should I do next? I'll do this, right? And that, that actually allows you to sort of have asynchronous um, read and writes. And there's where you would deal with your get, your, uh, your uh, gets, and your posts. Any questions about that before I move on? All of this kind of connotes the idea that there is a um, uh, there are several different solutions to creating web pages and serving them. Um, but one of the things that you've probably uh, guessed at already is that there are some really big, nice third-party apps that do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So we don't have to get into the details of you know, maybe even dealing with multiple different users and the fact that some users are in certain groups. Maybe we want uh, large code bases to handle the fact that we're, we want to build web pages, and we want them to be essentially battle tested from the beginning. We don't want to have to deal with all these different error cases and all these different cases when a string comes back. We want form checking automatically for us and all that stuff. So this is where web frameworks come in. Um, and uh, the idea here is that we're supposed to not spend a lot of time thinking about web frameworks, because a lot of people do this. It's, it's big business, even in, the, in the, Pi the Python world, especially in the Python world. Um, so some of the things that we would want to do is query database B for the activity of some user. We want to check that a submitted form field is of this type. So this is we want to actually ensure that we don't get back some empty string. And if we do, we want to throw a graceful error. Um, we want to you know, basically do whatever it is that you'd want to be doing on the web to present your data, to interact with your data, and to collaborate uh, with, your, um, with the people that you're doing the actual work uh, with and for. Um, and the whole idea, of course, is that uh, there's a lot of people who have put a lot of time into these frameworks. So the idea with a framework is that you are essentially um, using the tools that uh, each one of these frameworks has used. 
and built for you, and you kind of work within that structure. So if you've got Legos, you build a Lego house. You know, if you've got um, if you've got some other uh, building blocks, you use that. Um, uh, so one of the things that um, is pretty clear is that, as I said at the beginning, we all have Apache, and that is a web framework. Um, probably most of our interactions throughout our lives until the last few years has been knowingly or not with some Apache server on the, on the, on the back end. And as you can imagine, Apache has a plugin that allows you to basically call directly Python code. Um, that's called mod underscore Python. Unfortunately, it's not compliant with WSGI, so you can't write sort of a generic application. And Mod Python is essentially not used anymore. It's what I used when I first started building. You want to write Python code, right? And you want to do stuff. And then at some point, you're like, oh, I'd love to expose this function to the web, right? We did a little bit of this with the XML RPC stuff. But now you want to do this in, in the context of a, of a web browser. There is something, though, called Mod WSGI, um, which is a plugin for those of you that are using Apache you can basically build your WSGI Python applications and then uh, more or less restart your Apache server where you've uncommented out a line, which is basically mod underscore WSGI, and allows you then to um, more or less uh, go into and actually interact with a .py file. Um, most people are, are, for whatever reason, not, not using this because this is essentially an add-on to Apache. What people, I think, uh, in the uh, in the sort of development world and in the um, in the commercial world, uh, really think about sort of deploying their own framework. And there are a lot of frameworks uh, to choose from. These are just some of them. Actually, a small fraction of them. There is a extended talk from um, PyCon uh, from Australia from last uh, year, where some guy is basically going through and just rating all of these based on their usability and you know, um, essentially what he needed for his, uh, for his tasks. Um, there's some really major Python frameworks that are you know, mega code bases and you'd use if you're going to have you know, 10,000 users or something. That's like the, the Zope and the, the Pylons and the, and the Grok. Um, but there's some that are sort of called micro frameworks or mini frameworks that are um, also easily deployed, they have some uh, drawbacks, some limitations, they don't scale as well, et cetera, but they're starting to gain a lot of popularity. And those two are Bottle and Flask. Um, you can guess, I guess that's the answer to whiskey or something, right? <laughs> you gotta put, you got to put it somewhere. Actually, I don't know if that, that's actually been said on the web. Can you Google that? Because if not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to coin that term or that idea. You have to know where to put your whiskey. It should be in Bottle or Flask. Okay, um, so Bottle's nice because it's a web framework that has no dependencies other than the standard library. That's very cool. I think, however, it is not Python 3 compliant, and there's some moves to try to do that. Flask does have a few dependencies, and it's built on some uh, code bases that have been around for 10 years or so, so it's considered intrinsically more battle-tested, um, and I think it is ready for Python 3. I might be getting those two... Uh, um, uh, mixed up. It's using this thing called WorkZung and Jinga 2 for those that, that care about that. Um, and they're both very beautiful. If you go to those two web pages for Flask and Bottle, you'll see some very nice sort of Hello World uh, examples. And now um, it uses, ex it makes extensive use of decorators. What we'll um, uh, introduce today is Django, um, which is really kind of the de facto large web framework that people use um, in, the, uh, uh, in the real world. And um, it basically gives you all the functionality that you'd want to have in any modern web framework. And it's all completely um, uh, Pythonized. And we'll see some of the nice things about that in just a little bit. So um, we're going to build our uh, Hello World application here. Um, and I think some of you, we've already introduced virtual env, um, but if not, uh, what you may want to do is you may want to sort of do all this stuff within a virtual environment. So these are the calls you would need to get going in that. This is sort of optional. Um, effectively, you'd want to get going in a, in a virtual environment, which we'll just call um, Django. Uh, I'll let you, I think you guys all have the, um, 
lecture notes, so I'll let you just sort of cut and paste that in if you'd like to. But to get going, do a pip install Django or easy, unders easy underscore, underscore install uh, Django and see how that goes. That should install 1.3.1, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I can give you like a 10 second introduction to virtual environment. Um, the idea is that you want to build different uh, Python applications. Maybe one may be your web application. One may be the thing that interacts with your old Fortran code. Another one may be one that um, you know you use in your laboratory to interact with your your little gadgets and stuff. And each of them may have different dependencies. Like you may be using some legacy driver that requires you to have an old version of you know something, right? Virtual environments allow you to basically um, have completely uh, firewalled off um, Python environments, and you can have multiple different Python environments. So typically, what you would do is you'd start a virtual environment for like when I'm working within the class, right? And I want to be able to install stuff. But I know I've already got it somewhere else, and I, I know I've got working versions of older things that are really battle tested, but now I want to try, let's say, a development version of IPython, and I want to show you that in the class. I can, put, I can go into a virtual environment, install that, and then it's only accessible and only viewable by, uh, by me when I'm in that virtual environment. So for doing Django stuff, you may already have been developing uh, some web app, and you're you're comfortable using Django 0.99 and Django 1.0 breaks a couple of those things and you don't want to mess with that. Is, did I get that right? Okay. Um, anyone have any problems with Django in installation? What's that? Oh, yours is still installing. We'll give it one, one we'll give it 10 more seconds. So in your, um, in your environment, after you do that installation, there be, should be something called Django-admin.py, and it's got a bunch of different things you can use. We can uh, we can do a, a start project, which will basically create a structure of a project that we're going to wind up um, interacting with. And I I think in the tarball that I gave you, there's something called hello, which is a directory, and in that is some of the very basic functionality of a new Django project. So you can take a look at that. Um, but we can try to start that up together. Here I am. Um, by the way, uh, Casey Stark is here, and this is um, uh, his his slides and his uh, it worked example, so I'll take credit for that until it doesn't work, and then I'll ask him to stand up and talk about it. Um, okay, so what's that? Okay, so I have something called D hello, and you should see it looks like it looks like this. Um, we'll look more at that in just in just a bit, but let's see if this actually works. Okay, so I just ran that. You should have no barfs on the command line, and you see it starts something. Um, oops, called my hello. Ah, it wrapped. My hello, okay? And it should look just like the D hello. Okay? All right, um, so let's uh, sort of start looking at what these different files um, do. So the first one is urls.py. Um, you'll see something that looks like this. And views.py, you'll see something that looks like this. Uh, this should look um, 
this should look a lot like uh, this. And in fact, we're going to wind up editing things to look like this in just a minute. But what you notice here in views is that um, we're uh, pulling in this HTTP response, and this is now a file that we're essentially now, uh, or a file type that we're now sending strings to. And this index is going to look a lot like what we had as our uh, method within the uh, welcome page when we were doing cherry pie. We're going to wind up writing a bunch of things that uh, will interact with the web server. Um, and the URLs are more or less just a lookup of how I go from what I get on the, uh, at the URL level to where I should go. So now, this is saying basically match anything. So this is a regular expression string. So it's saying basically match, uh, match, the, um, no sl match anything that isn't uh, written out. So if I said greet user, it wouldn't match that. And this would just say, OK, this person wants the index at HTML. Go to views and look at the index and deal with that response in whatever the way that index says that you should. Um, so that stuff is not actually there out of the box in, in the code that you just, uh, you just created. So if I look at um, URLs, essentially I have a bunch of lookup patterns which is telling the web server, OK, when this person goes to admin slash doc, show them some documentation that's only available to admin users. Um, go here, I want to show them some home page. I want to call it home. Um, here, I'm going to wind up including some subdirectory. So all of this stuff is, uh, is blocked out. So we can't actually use it. So we actually have to change it. Um, so we'll actually do that. And I'll ask you to do that as well. OK, so let me email, or let me uh, edit this. To add that line that we had before, I think I need a comma. Um, and you notice that we don't have a views.py, so let's make a views.py. And I think um, for those that are having trouble editing or something, this D hello um, has the necessary edits in it. So that's what that should look like. And then. Um, we added a couple things. So here in this one, in the D hello, I also made sure that if I went to slash hello, um, that it would also map to the same place. So there's different ways to do this with regular expressions. And I'm not going to go into the details of what all these carrots and stuff mean. We've seen regular expressions uh, before. But this is now the structure of my, uh, of my code. And now we're going to have to run our web server to actually start serving this stuff out. Are there any questions so far? I'll, I'll go into some of the, the details in, in a few slides, but I just wanted you to all get comfortable um, editing and creating the right files for a Django project. Um, so we are now need to run python space manage.py run server. And you notice uh, that there is a manage.py here. And this is just um, doing almost nothing. It's just looking to find a module called settings. And it's dealing with stuff gracefully when it's not finding it. And so settings have a whole bunch of interesting things in here that we're going to wind up playing with later on. Um, you can set up uh, the sense of who admin people are, uh, what type of databases we're going to wind up using, um, and then uh, actually whether you expose um, some of the admin uh, functionality. And then you're going to wind up 
um, having all the applications, these are now this concept of this web application, you're going to wind up putting in here, and we'll wind up actually adding those things directly. And then there's some logging information and all that stuff. So this is a pretty big code base. It takes a long time to get to understand what each of these things is doing. But recognize that the sort of out of the box template example that you wind up getting sort of sets this all up for a default and you can run it and it is you know, as battle tested as something like um, Apache might be considered. Um, let me just take a look at the settings of the dhello. And you see in the, in the D hello, I actually uncommented out these functionalities of um, administrative uh, privileges. Okay, well anyway, let's, let's start the web server without further ado. Let's see if that works. Ah, okay, got no errors. Uh, it validated all my models. We'll see what validation of models means um, in just a bit. Here's my Django version, 1.31. And now I can go to my web server. And I'll go up here. Hello world. Right, so we built our first Hello World application. If I wanted to use local tunnel now, I could give you all the ability to go in and start hitting my web server, right? Um, let me give you uh, sort of one minute for those that are trying to catch up to this to try to get that going as well. If you have problems, raise your hand. Is anyone getting any errors? Effectively, what you do is emulate um, what you see in urls.py in the dhello directory, and then also um, emulate what you see uh, in the views.py in the dhello. Or you could just go to dhello and type python manage.py run server. Yes? This would work, but I'm just sort of like, what are, what are we doing at a very high level? There's a lot of like things moving around right now. Yeah. Like a really high level summary of what this is all doing. Um, okay, I'll do that now in the next slide. That'd be awesome. Okay. Yes, I wanted you to just see how all this works, because that's like, oh man, exactly. What? Why am I editing this? Why am I doing this? Let me see if we can get a, a little bit of a big picture here. Um, well, first of all, you are doing at the very base level what Cherry Pie was doing and what base HTTP server was doing at the very beginning, right? You are creating uh, and running a web server that's doing some functionality, right? And how you route things around when I go to the web browser and I type in localhost, you know, 8000, then the web server says, okay, you've just requested essentially nothing, you essentially request an index.html without actually explicitly saying that, what am I supposed to do? All right, let me go look at views.py, and views.py says, oh, that routes to uh, some other functionality um, that I now know how to, uh, sorry, urls.py was where I look, and then I route to some other functionality in views.py, and I know, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to use, uh, I'm supposed to use this uh, um, object, and it's, you know, it's, a, um, it's a subclass of the uh, HTTP response. And now I'm just going to do whatever happens inside of that. And then I'm, then I'm done for now until somebody else requests something else of me. If I, I mean, if I go back and I go into um, some other place within that, uh, within that web server, it says, I don't know how to match that. So it's actually kind of useful to see, see this. I put this in debug mode, so of course you don't have to put in debug mode. So the request method was get, the request URL was this, and I'm looking at 
uh, myhello.urls, uh, and I only knew how to do one thing, which was to match nothing. And now you gave me something called buy. I don't even know how to match that. I don't even know what to do with that. Um, I mean, if it's helpful, I can go through and we can figure out how we would handle this. You want to see if we can handle this? All right, let's try to handle it. Um, by the way, this thing is um, timing out here. It's still trying to go to that URL because I killed the cherry pie. Um, and yet it's, it's trying to basically go to a place that's being mapped to something where nothing's being served from. Um, let's take a look at what we had up in here. So this is in, uh, this is in uh, the D hello. And what you see here is I actually created two mappings. So I created a hello slash. So let's just copy that and we'll change that to buy. Um, let me kill this. So I'm going to go into URLs. And I'll now map something else that I can do. You can pick anything else, but convention is to call it views. And then actually every subdirectory may have its own views associated with it. So what you could do is when you get a slash something and it's you know uh, by, then you've got a directory called by, and you could just have its own views inside of that. So the top level directory says, I don't even know what to do in all the sub, you know, sub slashes of by, but I know that somebody else is going to take care of that view for me. Right? So you can sort of pass views down the road if you want to. So let's, um, let's, uh, let's create a new functionality called by. And we could call it by by just to convince you that it doesn't have to be the same thing as what that URL is, right? I can map it to anything that I want. Um, yes, which I think is you, you could also call that. No, URLs.py is something that's looked up by the, the main web server, and you could even change that name. But again, it's convention to keep all that stuff. Um, so now we need to change views, and we need to create something called uh, by. Bye bye. Okay, so you would just keep on building up your functionality by, oh, I'd really like to have a login page, or I'd really like to have a you know, view file page or download file page, and then you have to know how to do that um, within the, the Django framework. So inside, inside of URLs, I created a new mapping, which when the user went to buy slash, um, I, I sent it to views.byby. I could have called it anything I want. I could have put it in something else called by and then inside of that file, by.py, inside of that file, it could have done stuff. Okay. It's up to you to organize it how you want to. Yeah. Have to that's right. Import. Exactly. Yeah. These are some of the weird. Like you'd like to actually just not have that as a string. It makes right. sense to actually give it essentially the function, right? But yes, it's doing an evaluation. It, it does some look ahead to make sure that that file is there and blah blah blah. Right? You can do that. You can do it without yeah. without strings. Oh, okay. The empty string at the beginning of patterns. Yeah. You can pass uh, sort of the Python path as a string to prepend to all of the the rest of the paths you put as the second argument in every. It's oh, right. So that tells you that you could have your code base somewhere else. It wouldn't have to be in the same like sort of subdirectory of where you're running your project. Um, 
Yeah, you could do that. It's usually if you have one of the the Django apps, and you could say like uh, code blocks as the first one, and then you use use dot index, so that would refer to the module code blocks dot use and dot index function. Okay. Well, we're not going to build something that complicated for now, but it looks like you, you, can, you can do a lot. All right, anyway, so just keep it like the way it is now with the strings. Um, all right, remember when we talked um, about databases and we talked about our interaction with the, with the databases, we wanted to have this concept of a model view controller, and we talked about this also in the concept when we talked about uh, GUIs, um, and when we were, especially when we were talking about... Um, uh, Chaco and and traits, um, particular traits. We talked about the model view controller paradigm. Um, this idea that you have some base sort of understanding of the relationship of your data to other pieces of the data, and then a view of that data. And remember, traits was really nice because you created some abstract object which had a bunch of attributes and things like color and who its parent was, and you had this concept of foreign keys. Um, uh, we wound up being able to view that directly. We remember we created a view and we popped up a GUI. Um, now, effectively, what views are doing is it allows us to look at um, not just uh, models, in this case, essentially high-level abstractions of our, of our data, um, but also different views on different, um, uh, different modules that are going to wind up producing and creating different functionality for us. Um, that's, that's maybe a little bit hand wavy, uh, so I want to sort of actually give you some examples of what it is that I'm talking about there. Um, but anyway, the way Django does stuff is with the model URL view template idea. So templates create effectively different types of views on on our data, um, and then the the routing stuff, which happens with URLs URLs.py, that happens um, uh, in that file. Okay, let me get into some details so that you actually see what it is I'm talking about. When we talk about uh, models, we talk about um, the sort of uh, conception of of data, and if you want to think about this in terms of a relational database and say SQL Lite three or MySQL. We might think of um, the concept of, uh, of tables. And now when I want to connect models together, I'm effectively creating foreign keys that are going to link back to primary keys of other tables. One of the very nice things that Django does for you, in the same way that SQL Alchemy does this for you, is it has an object relational manager that will abstract the actual database for you. So you will have an SQL Lite database or a MySQL database or a Postgres or a SQL Server or whatever as your back engine to store all of your data. Um, but it allows you to think about that data in exactly the same way irrespective of um, what your uh, database is. So models is where the data goes and um, the classes that uh, model the data objects are the ones that you'll be using inside of your application. Um, and we can store uh, whatever in whatever database we want. So here is uh, very similar to what we did with traits. Um, now we basically will subclass uh, something called uh, models.model, and we're going to create um, some uh, object called the lecture. And what are the things that we'd like to know about a lecture? Um, well, whatever its name is, what semester it's in, the number of students who are associated with that lecture, et cetera. Um, so here, you're basically creating attributes of this model. And we've seen this before, so hopefully you guys are comfortable with it. The nice things that we saw in traits is the same th nice things that we saw that we get out of models with Django. And in particular, it makes sure that we do error checking, and so we do type checking. So if somebody tries to add a new, um, a new lecture to, uh, you know, to our database, if it um, if it is not t if its name is not of type car field, then it will barf and you'll get and you'll get errors. So you, people can't pollute our database, um, and it makes sure that you basically have everything in the way that you want it to to, to arrive. Um, and so there's a lot of different uh, types of types, um, and I'll give you a URL for that in just a couple of uh, 
in just a couple of slides. Incidentally, you often see this underscore, and you put it in front of strings. This is for uh, internationalization, so you could have lookup tables that allow you to um, you know, basically very seamlessly show uh, your same website in different languages. You don't have to have that. It's just kind of nice that Django deals with internationalization stuff for you. Again, probably you're not going to want that in your real world applications because you guys are not building massive frameworks for people. But if you are, you know, Django is sort of the, one of the places you'd like to go. So um, just like in traits, uh, there is that concept of the relationship um, between objects and models. So we have a concept of like a car manufacturer, and it's going to have a bunch of um, attributes. Uh, we have a concept of a car. It's going to have um, a couple of different uh, um, a couple of different uh, manufacturers. So it might you know it'll point back to the foreign key of our manufacturers. Here I didn't give it any attributes, so it's going to have maybe some ID number, which gets auto incremented for me. And I haven't told you about rows or columns or who's dealing with the database stuff. Django's doing that for you. It'll, again, it abstracts the, the, the sort of SQL level database interactions for you to be able to basically just play with models. Um, so here's the company ID. And I'm going to wind up um, pointing back to uh, um, the Cadillac company. I should have updated this because some of these companies are like probably bankrupt by now. Um, and I've already mentioned the, um, the ORM that Django provides for you. Essentially, I think, is it even using SQL Alchemy as its ORM? Uh, the last time I checked, it wasn't. But okay. It yeah, okay. So anyway, you've, you've already seen SQL Alchemy. You know why ORMs are very nice. They're nice. Okay, so again, um, let's go into what the URLs are doing. This is where you can sort of pass things off. So we can set up very complex um, URL patterns. And um, I won't go into the details of what all this stuff is doing. But you can see that we can get with, um, you, we can get with uh, uh, the, um, uh, these various reg uh, regular expressions the ability to sort of send different things to different places. So I have an issue, and I want to you know, I've got some issue number, and I want to delete that issue. Then I'm going to send that somewhere, and I'm going to send it to something called delete. Um, here, I'm going to send everything that says issues. Sorry, everything here, I'm going to send to issues. It's all structured. It's all hierarchical. So you can send things into other directories and have those other directory URLs deal with that, that sort of stuff. Um, and then the views. So this is just sort of an example. We're not going to actually wind up using this stuff. But um, here is where you would actually have the functionality that says, oh, this person requested uh, this photo. And I've got, I either got this or I don't have it. So I'm going to send you back the result of that. And then templates, that's the new thing that what I haven't shown you yet. Um, templates look a lot like HTML. But if I'm going to reuse a page over and over again, instead of in my Python, uh, more or less rewriting HTML. Now what you do is you basically write templates that look a lot like HTML, except they have um, variables. And when you wind up rendering this template as HTML, what you basically do to the renderer is you pass it the template you want to use, and you pass it these, uh, these variables. And so you might have content, and if it's none, you might say, uh, don't show any, I don't, I don't have any content. So templating languages, you know, is, it's, you have to know HTML and you have to know the way in which each one of your web frameworks does templates. I think there's a convergence at some level into only one or two different templating protocols. So templates generally look really simple. You basically build your web page and you'd like to say, oh, the page title is going to be, you know, my pet goat, right? And the content is going to be whatever content I want to send it. That's the stuff that's going to change from page after page. If I have a new book and I want to render stuff like that, um, I change the page title when I wind up rendering the HTML. And so there, what you're thinking of is somebody's made a request. They say, give me the next book in your library. And you pull over some information. So you're going to do a query on your, on your models. 
you pull over the next one, and it's got a variable or an attribute called page title, and then when you render your template, you just render that, right? And so you're, you get to reuse HTML with this. Um, now, why is it that we're actually going through all this trouble? Well, I think probably for any of the web applications that you all might wind up making um, for your own work, something like Cherry Pie or Flask or Bottle might be enough. But one of the great things that Django has is all of these third-party plugins that allow you to do high-level stuff that you don't have to build the full functionality effectively. They just give you the ability to do that. So user registration, like dealing with you know, passwords over the internet and dealing with passwords that are too short or too long, somebody's built an app for that, right? Um, doing tags on, uh, on blog content. Somebody's built a little applet for that. All these things already exist. So one of the nice things that you think of when you're thinking about building a big Django application is pulling in lots of functionality from all over the place. And then the thing that's new that you do is just a little part of the full application that this Django web framework provides for you. So it's plug and play. So this is something that uh, Casey had in one of his um, applications. These are all the codes. This is just the code that he wrote. So this points effectively to Python code that he wrote. Everything else that he needed, he just pulled in. So there's Ajax validation, there's pagination, there's sign up stuff, there's analytics. You know, you can pull in a great deal of this functionality without having to write this stuff yourself. And that is, I think, one of the um, best selling points of, of, build, of building your application on a massive framework like this. It's a little bit painful to understand the connections of all these different files together. But under the hood, you're building some functionality. You're dealing with data and the concept of a model. You're creating views that point you from some URL to somewhere else. And you're reusing all the stuff that people have already done for you. OK, so for the breakout, we're going to try to build a Django framework that has some functionality of, uh, of use. And what we're going to try to do is build some sort of journal where you might sort of effectively have blog entries um, just by you, but you could add other, other people into this. So first of all, um, there is something called, I think, uh, journal underscore skeleton in the tarball that I gave you. Is that, is that there? Yes. So it's already got some of the starts for you. And what you'll notice is that there is a directory called Artic uh, articles, and inside of that will look a lot like the top level directory. It will have a views and a URL, and in that it's going to have something models. You're going to wind up editing those, those models. That's the first thing we'll wind up doing. And those models will be, uh, we want to, want to add all of these attributes to this model. So we're going to have a title, some sort of slug comment, uh, or essentially uh, that'll give us our, our final URL. The author name, which will be of uh, type user, uh, when this is published, so that's going to be some sort of date time object, an abstract, which will be some sort of blob or text string, a body. Go to this URL right here and look at the different um, uh, types of, uh, of attributes that you can have inside of models and pick appropriate um, uh, attributes. And the good thing is, while we could build in a bunch of different ways to, uh, and build web pages that allow us to um, add and delete uh, each one of these articles, or blog entries, or whatever, however you want to think of it, um, we'll just let the admin do that. And so what we'll wind up doing is commenting out a few lines in the admin, um, in the settings that allow us to uh, interact with our models as an admin user and change things. Let me, I'll show you this. I'll come back to this in just a second. Let me just show you what this looks like. Um, so the nice thing is, once you get going, you can have a um, uh, models, and uh, inside of those models will be articles, and then I'll be able to add uh, to uh, uh, to those articles and essentially add new entries. So how do we um, how do we do that? Uh, well, we can have a foreign key of type user, and we basically pull in from Django contrib auth models 
this concept of a, of a user. And so we let Django just deal with the authentication of users and, and storing their email addresses and whatever other information we might want for them. So you're going to wind up creating an author attribute within inside of your articles uh, um, models, and it will be of type models uh, dot foreign key user. That's one of the things that you'll need to do. And I think I've already given you the templates to render the site, so we can actually look at stuff. So here's my site. I've got a um, I've got a variable called head title, and I've got some body that I'm going to wind up showing. And then the nice thing is Django is extensible, so when we template um, when we template this uh, site underscore base .html, what I do is I basically pull in the full functionality from this thing, and now I can uh, I can add more stuff myself. So the head title I'm basically writing directly will be all articles. I think I've already given you those templates. Is there a templates directory in there? So you don't have to you don't have to worry about that now. You'll need it for your your homework. So I just wanted you to see that. Okay. So um, get working on this. I'll give you about uh, 20 minutes, and we're all around to to help you. So the first thing to do, um, obviously, the the documentation is your friend, and you should go look at the Django documentation. What you should do is interact with models.py and add some attributes there. And I've given you on the previous slides what I'd like you to add. Title, slug, author, published, abstract, body. So you're just going to figure out the appropriate um, uh, types to add here. And then you're going to wind up needing to edit your urls.py to point to the appropriate place. And I've given you a journals.tgz, I think. Um, if you try to unzip that, it is encrypted. And I, can't, I will tell you the password at the end. But that is the solution. You already have that already. Try to crack it if you want to spend all your time on that. 